Good morning and welcome to Coping with COVID updates about the pandemic and information to help you thrive and survive COVID-19. I'm Trey Taylor and you know we talked so much about businesses uh, being affected by the coronavirus. Well, one of the other industries, one of the main industries that have been affected are the schools. And today we're talking to uh, Dr. Baron Davis, superintendent with Richland School District 2. Good morning, Baron. Yeah, good morning, Trey. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. You are a product of a uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And, uh, you know, I've, I've just heard that you grew up in the kind of Saxon home area, went to C.A. Johnson, you said? C.A. Johnson High School, class of 1990. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, I mean, this is home for you. You are familiar with the, uh, you know, the school district, the, you know, kind of what's going on with school. So this was such a great transition for you to mm -hmm. uh, come from being a product of the schools and being a school superintendent. Absolutely. Uh, it was not, you know, I, I didn't really start out in my career thinking I was going to end up being a school superintendent or a school administrator, but, you know, I've learned so much from so many administrators um, uh, over my time. I've actually spent a lot of time studying since second grade. I spent a good little bit of time in their offices. since. I <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> I've, I've learned a lot over the years, and so I, I definitely was prepared for this opportunity. <laughs> right. Okay. So I, I know we want to talk about what's going on in school, but I have to ask, what were you in the office for, Barrett? <laughs> oh, that uh, <laughs> was one of those. I was one of those kids who uh, who, who uh, had challenges at at times. <laughs> so I got to know my school administrator as well. I knew my, Very well. I knew my superintendent by name and all that good stuff. So uh, I've been well prepared. Well prepared. <laughs> Don't feel bad. Me too. <laughs> so Baron, I know that you have been actually communicating with uh, the parents and the students via Facebook Live. So tell me how this transition has been for uh, the kids in the school district too, and the parents too. Well, I, I do believe that our parents and our students have, have, have really um, excelled as, as much as possible in this COVID-19 uh, pandemic era. I, I think um, we have a really strong school community uh, in Richland School District 2. Uh, our parents have shown so much support and trust in what our educators are doing. Um, and we just try to stay uh, out front and communicate as much as we can and be as transparent as we can and involve as many parties as we can in order to make the best uh, decisions for our students. And so um, I try to keep an open line of communication through Facebook uh, Live and other forms of communications with our parents. And uh, that's been able to really kind of inform me uh, how people are feeling and what's the, really the right direction to drive. How fast should we be driving? Should we slow down? Should we speed up? Those types of things. So it's been it's been very empower, empowering uh, for me, but powerful for us as a community, too. So are each of the uh, teachers giving, uh, I guess, a packet of notes or classes yeah. or um, uh, your work to to the students? And then do they do you do it via email? Do they pick them yeah. up? How has that process been working? So it's, it's been in a couple of phases. And we initially started out um, our um, kindergarten through fifth grade students, our elementary students received uh, a packet. Um, and our middle school and high school students were receiving their work through Google Classroom. We were fortunate, we've been a woman in the school district for many years now, and about 75% of our teachers had already had a Google Classroom set up. Um, so it was really easy for them to transition to putting everything in Google Classroom at that point. And we tried to build up the capacity of the teachers who didn't have it to do so. After spring break, um, right before spring break started, we sent out um, devices to our second, third, fourth, and fifth graders. Um, and so now they are using their Google Classrooms, yeah. uh, second grade through 12th grade. Our pre-K through first grade students receive additional packets at the um, at the spring break. And I just I felt like or we felt like that that was just a little bit too early and too young to try to give them a device to have at home to manage, as well as some of the other challenges that come along with that. Um, so. Our teachers have a schedule that they meet uh, that's been sent out and they, they meet with their students uh, throughout the week. Um, 
at shorter periods of time, not the same length of a normal class, um, but uh, they still make those daily or weekly connections with their students um, face uh, through a virtual platform. Mm -hmm. Now, how will they be graded? Is there gonna be some adjustments made? Right, so, so our sixth grade through uh, 12th grade students are still receiving uh, traditional um, uh, numerical grades particularly those students who what we call weighted grades or Carne Carnegie unit grades, grades for credit, like algebra, geometry, you still have to give those students an actual numerical grade in order for them to progress to the next grade level or to prog uh, or be or progress to the next course. Um, that hasn't been weighed by um, SDE, by the State Department of Education. Our elementary students are being graded um, pre-K through, uh, I believe, first grade. They're going to get like a, either satisfactory or unsatisfactory as their grade for the year uh, for the uh, second semester of school. Uh, our second through fifth graders will be graded as pass or not pass. Um, and they're not going to get that numerical grade that they would traditionally get in second through fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Our focus right now is simply uh, our students learning the essential standards and indicators that they need for the next grade level. Gotcha. So we're not really focusing on heavily on testing or uh, any standardized testing or anything like that. We are really focused on these are the essential skills, standards, and indicators of learning you need to know in preparation for the next grade level. And that's what the teachers and the students are focusing on. So what happens with a child who is having some challenges? I mean, are, are, are they going to be left back or are they going to be able to move forward and just given some uh, extra help? Oh, they, they're getting, yeah, they'll get the extra help that they need. We'll spend some time. Um, we have programs during the summer. Of course, we have our summer reading camps. Um, we'll have uh, some camps that's focusing. The State Department will be having some camps that's focusing on reading and mathematics. Um, we will be focusing on camps on and, and reading as well. Um, for our students um, in middle school, we have what we call content recovery. Um, so if there's something or a concept that you have not mastered, then you have an opportunity through the summer to work on those in order to be promoted to the next grade level. And same thing at the high schools. Um, we're still gonna be offering uh, virtual summer school programs. Um, we have a pretty decent, robust virtual platform that was already in place. And so it's just really now integrating the brick and mortar classrooms um, into that, more into that virtual platform. Mm -hmm. um, and so with the one on one, with the back and forth, I should say communication, we should have a good understanding idea of where those gaps are and, and, and an intent to close those gaps. Well, you talked about a uh, summer school. How is summer school and going into the next school year going to look different? Uh, post COVID-19? Yeah, summer school for us last year um, for, the, for the high schools was already virtual. So oh, okay. yeah, we were already using that as a, as, as a summer school. So we'll, we'll continue to have virtual summer schools. Um, we'll do the same thing for our middle schools as well. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at the opportunity if there's a need at the middle school level, um, particularly if a student may need some additional support, we may be able to structure some time where we can have small groups of students maybe report to the building, but we're not quite sure if that's something that's 100% uh, possible right now, but that's something that we're looking into. I think next year when school starts back, whenever that may be, um, there are going to be so many practices in place that are, uh, are going to be very, I think, health-centered. Um, with washing hands, spacing, mm -hmm. reduction of crowds um, in, 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 in uh, spaces, um, uh, whether or not, um, you know, the possibility that the, the uh, SC Accelerated um, Committee's task force is talking about A-B days, possibly um, mm -hmm. staggered schedules, um, uh, brick and more virtual courses where you can offer them a combination. Maybe there's blended learning combinations of virtual and brick and mortar. So uh, there are a lot of different possibilities. I don't think it'll look anything like it looked um, before March um, in that in those first few months. Yeah, you mentioned the SC Ed um, Task Force with, uh, of course, uh, Superintendent Molly Spearman, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to mention a report just came out today about A B days, and uh, of course, uh, that means some kids will go on an A day and some kids will go on a B day. Yeah, that's that's what I think it it means. I haven't had a chance to look at the report yet, but I can imagine because we um, we have in some schools we have an A B day schedule now, and that could be confusing to some parents. 
But on those A, B days, everyone's in school on the, at the same time. I'm going to imagine, uh, I would have guessed that the A, B day, there would be suggestions that Baron Davis is assigned to come to school on A day and take his classes. And Trey Taylor is going to come to school on B day and take her classes. And so we can reduce the number of students in the building at the same time. Yeah, but and, and of course, and I know everything's not been worked out, but that then goes into childcare. If if you know, if I'm an elementary school student, right, or even a, a young middle school student, and I've got to go to school on A day, what happens to me on the B days? Am I home alone? You know, the childcare situation. Uh, what if my parent is a teacher? Um, can we make sure that me and my siblings are go both going on the same day? Yeah. Well, that's a lot to uh, kind of figure out. I would imagine, uh, uh, Trey, that that hopefully this is something that's going to be coordinated with the reopening of, I guess, South Carolina. Yeah. And if, it, if it's not, it's going to be extremely difficult um, for for parents to have to make that decision on. Um, if my son is on A day and my daughter's on B day and I still have to go to work. Um, right. <laughs> they're saying, you know, no, you now you need to report to work. Um, so I'm sure the task force is taking that in consideration. I, I know several people that are on that task force that are very student centered. Uh, cent uh, center. We have one of our, our our very own teachers on there, uh, Patrick Kelly, and oh, cool. Superintendent uh, Spearman uh, is focused on that as well. So I'm I'm hoping uh, that 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 those considerations will be taken and in, in, put into play. Baron Davis is with us. He is superintendent of Richland School District Two in Columbia, South Carolina. Now, Baron, what would be an ideal plan for you post COVID? What what would you think uh, would be good that would work for you and your students in R two? Um, for us, um, an ideal plan would be some sort of, a, uh, I think some sort of slow integration. Um, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of training that still needs to be, um, I think done for our teachers, professional development. There's a different pedagogical approach to teaching, um, virtual than, than teaching brick and mortar. Uh, I think sometimes the expectations that a virtual classroom should be just like a brick and mortar classroom, uh, and it's not. Right. So we need to make sure that we get the proper training for our staff, because one thing I, I, I'm pretty confident in the trade is that this won't be the first time this is going to happen. And so it will, it will be a, a mistake to go too fast and not have the structures in place. So should we have to revert pivot back mm -hmm. to, to virtual? We have a an infrastructure <clears throat> that can support that exactly. Uh, in our district, we're we're fortunate and we're blessed, and I, I in, in a lot of ways, um, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, but oftentimes, in my position, I also want to advocate for those school districts and those children in, in South Carolina that that don't have the resources that our students have. Right, right. Rural South Carolina looks very different than Columbia, South Carolina. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I, I know those those who who make those decisions above my 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 level here are aware of those things. So infrastructure is really going to be important um, as we progress um, to ensure that our students have the appropriate platform to, to be successful. Um, because our, our goal in Richland too is to put our students in a position to be global citizens, um, prepared to lead and excel in their chosen pathway. Um, and um, you know, I, I want all the resources that are available to me and to our disposal in order to make that happen. Have you worked with any of your teachers um, to kind of help them with the virtual classroom thing? Because you're right. It's one thing to be in the classroom. It's a whole nother thing to try to capture and keep someone's attention. And they're not even in the same room with you. Yeah. Yes, we have. We've been doing professional development opportunities right. for our teachers to be able to, to be able to strengthen their capacity. I will say that I, I think our teachers have done, a, again, a phenomenal job. I think one of the biggest challenges for our teachers is really helping them fight through um, that fit those fight through um, the I guess the disappointment that they have they can't connect with their kids every day. Um, I, I've shared this before that that if you are an educator and educated, there is an energy that exists in a building. Yeah, that energy cannot be replicated. Um, through a virtual platform, and our teachers crave and our students 
crave that energy. Even when they don't know that it is there, they don't realize that they crave, but you pull them out of that environment and you take that energy source away from them. And then now they're craving it. And that's why I, te- I see our teachers struggle with that. They yeah. want to be with their kids and our kids want to be with their, they want to be with their teachers. And that the virtual, the virtual format can never replace that energy that exists between the student and the teacher. Right. Right, because there's a relationship there. Absolutely, it's a real relationship, is not, and it's authentic, and you know, and and uh, and always, I pray that it's helpful and healthy and beneficial for 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 both parties involved. One thing that uh, Richland too has done that I thought was amazing. A lot of the school districts have done it: the free food for students throughout the week, and you guys just implemented it throughout the weekend too. Right. One of the things that COVID-19 has done for us is exposed, uh, or I would say magnify mm-hmm. uh, the uh, inequities that re- exist in our communities, not mm-hmm. just these educational inequities as it relates to access to technology and broadband, which is, is a huge inequity that exists in the state of South Carolina, but it has also demonstrated community inequity that exist. And so we we want to be good community partners um, and, uh, we're, you know, fortunate in a position where we're able to extend our, our nutritious meal program to our students throughout um, the week. And then, of course, throughout the weekend as, as we're beginning to close up school a little bit. But we want to make sure that their students aren't missing meals um, in, in, in the district. Yeah. And so how is that set up? Do the kids come and pick them up? Uh, Do they pick them up like do do they get seven days of food or do they come every day? So right now we're we're still doing an everyday pickup um, and we have designated locations throughout the district where they can come and and get their food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I know that uh, uh, the school districts got some money through the CARES Act and 90 percent of that, uh, I think it was two point two billion dollars was given directly to the schools. Do you know what you are going to focus your monies on in Richland, too? So the, the CARES Act money that was going to be distributed to school districts is going to be distributed to the districts based on their, from my understanding, based on their um, Title I um, fund funding formula. So the amount of money you get is based on, you know, the number of students you have in your district that qualify as title as, as recipients of, of Title I funding or schools that qualify for that. So that's going to vary from school district to school district. There are about 12 different pots of, of places that you can spend this money in. And you have to spend the money before December of this school of this year, a calendar year. So what we've done is we've 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 convened our own task force of folk to really look at what our needs are going to be, because you can um, any any expense that you have that fits into those 12 pots that's related to COVID-19 um, um, pandemic, you can then use that those funds for that. Um, so we, we have a task force that's been led by our uh, CFO. Um, uh, to really look at what our needs are um, and what's going to be the best approach to do this. I, I don't like to jump out and just identify anything without really bringing um, some key people to the table and saying, right, okay, right. you know, this is what we really, really need. Cause I, I, I only, you know, as superintendent, you want to, all oh, you always looking out and up. I need people who are looking down and in yeah. to really tell me what, what I need to be, what we need to be doing so I can continue to move us forward. Exactly. What's really happening in the trenches that you could really um, utilize these these resources for with the kids coming back or however that, you know, however that ends up being. Right. Any idea. And I know you said you hate to jump out, but any ideas right now, (laughs) Baron, um, what you're kind of thinking? Yeah, I I mean, for certain now we we, we were looking at some of our. Um, we were looking at some infrastructure, um, trying to shore up to ensure that if we have to go back to a virtual format, we have the appropriate resources that every student will have access. Right now, we did a, a, a brief survey with Spectrum and we found about 96% of our, our families in the Richland 2 community have the ability to connect to uh, the internet. Um, that now they don't mean they have the modem man, the actual router to do right, it. But we, right. we do have a, 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 about four percent of our district right now that don't that does not have the infrastructure to do that. 
Sure. And so we really need to then now disaggregate that and really find out who those 4%, what that what that 4% demographic really looks like, where they are, and what can we do to, to close that gap. And we're also trying to work on a partnership to see maybe if we can work on some sort of affordable program for all students to qualify for free and reduced lunch to be able to get a, a discounted rate on internet access through a provider. So we're hoping that's going to work out. So we may be using funds to really try to sure sure that up as well as well. Yeah, that is huge. Go ahead. You were saying I was going to say some of it. I'm sure it's going to it's going to be used for um, um, closing gaps, edu academic and educational gaps for our students, uh, opportunity gaps for our students that were create that were created or even exacerbated by by COVID nineteen as, as well. Yeah, I was going to say that internet access is huge, Baron, because I know um, there there is uh, in the the governor's SC Accelerate Task Force just this week. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Artis, president of Benedict College, made the point that her students, many of her students, and the, of course her students at Benedict are uh, located all over, but everyone does not have internet access, and it is so difficult to conceive in 2020 that everyone doesn't have access to the internet as huge uh, a need as as huge as the internet is needed and 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 available and so they made the point um and james bennett was one of those people that really talked about it too and and the um uh, attorney um the uh, assistant um governor um if, um pam everett said that um having access to broadband in South Carolina in every place, because there are places, they were saying there are places right here in downtown Columbia that don't have access, that the broadband access is probably the top, one of the top three things to really bring our state forward and fill in so many of the gaps and inequities uh, that we're having now. It is, Trey, it's, it's, it's a, it should be a basic utility. Right. You should not be able to build anything like you can't build a home or community without tapping into water, right. and tapping into electricity or gas. Um, and so broadband access should be that that basic of, of, of a utility for it's a necessity. Yeah. yeah, that 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 you now patched in to uh, broadband. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the rate of what it may be, but but you know you 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 have the ability to be patched in and connected to that. That's how basic it should be, and it should be a fundamental uh, expectation uh, for any community or any place um, where you where you reside. Right, because you're cut off from the rest of the world if you don't have it. Right. And it goes beyond just education. And that's what I say yeah. this is more about community inequities also than educational inequities. Um, be, because I've, I've seen COVID affect more than just my students. I've seen COVID affect senior citizens. Yes. Um, um, and and our need to, to make sure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable citizens, our senior citizens, our youngest children, um, those who need uh, those who may need uh, mental um, uh, uh, help as well, um, who, who may be struggling with issues. And so um, that broadband connectivity could help with telehealth services in community. Yes. You can't yes. to, to the doctor. To get the doctor or get, yeah. I mean, so that it is, a, it's definitely an essential thing that we need to make sure that we are, we cannot go post COVID and not have infrastructure to, 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 to uh, correct some of those, those inequities. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Food, water, electricity, and you should have also <laughs> uh, the opportunity to have broadband. Marvell Mend Williams Mendenhall it has uh, joined us. We want to thank her. She wants to know about hotspots. She says she thinks they should have hotspots in every community. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and, and recently too, what we've done is we've turned up the the, the uh, Wi-Fi kind of range at every school. Um, in our district, at every district off, at every district building, so that you can come to a um, Richland Two facility and be in the parking lot, and you should be able to pick up the guest Wi-Fi hotspot. We have deployed um, buses um, with Wi-Fi capability into certain parts of the community as well, so people can have the access to to get online. Um, but she's absolutely right. You need more of an infrastructure in place where people can wherever they are. And in some cities around the country, it's, it's like that. Regardless yeah. of where you are, you, you're connected to public Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, that's I think that's a direction I'm sure South Carolina and Columbia is going to be moving in, in toward. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I know, like you said, uh, when we started out, you've been using uh, the Internet Facebook for your communication with parents and uh, to celebrate your seniors. I know that you also have uh, tapped in to another source of social media. Yeah. <laughs> Lexington District 5 has announced that they're going to do a traditional um, graduation with yeah. Lexington people so what are you guys gonna do on richland school district two yeah i appreciate you asking that question <laughs> everyone's uh so we we put a tap we pu actually pulled the task force together a couple weeks ago led by um one of our assistant superintendents guys and uh uh, that task force consisted of student leaders uh, uh principal student activity directors um um Security staff, health okay, health officials, wow. and uh, so to, to really determine if we could logistically handle a uh, a a outdoor graduational graduation uh, ceremony in a district, uh, and um, so I was announcing that today on TikTok. All um, right, I had a student on my Facebook on Facebook Live say that Dr. Mm -hmm. Davis you should do it by via TikTok. So today at uh, ten o'clock, it was. So you got, are you going to dance? I, no, I'm not doing a dance. I actually, I actually did the. Uh, so I got my, I deployed my, my, my resident uh, cool experts uh, uh, in my house with my daughters, <laughs> and uh, they told me that they suggested I do the album cover challenge. That all the students oh. would know what the album cover challenge was. So I did the album cover challenge, um, oh. and to announce that we will be doing uh, our, our um, traditional, a traditional graduation setting in the COVID nineteen at Harry Perron Stadiums. Uh, each high school will have a day for graduation. It should be able to start at 8 a.m. Um, um, and each graduation will be at one at the Perron Stadium. We will live stream it, um, two guests per um, per senior. Um, and of course, we'll put in all the social distancing uh, protocols in place. Um, so, you know, restricting um, entrance and exits, the um, part. For, uh, for students and uh, and for their guests, um, uh, limiting uh, in, uh, assigned entry points for each family. You have a certain entry point, so everyone will come into the same entry or exit point. Gotcha, and be backed up. Yeah, things like that. Um, wearing mm -hmm. requiring mask. So mm -hmm. all the logistics and all those things are going to be communicated. Temperature um, checks too. Yeah, yeah. that's what we're, we're shooting for temperature. Want to do these temperature checks as well. Um, and uh, we, of course, we'll be asking people if they're feeling ill or sick to not come, right? Because we will be live streaming it, um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll. Those are the types of logistical things we're working out, but we will be doing um, a brick and mortar. I mean, we'll be doing a, a traditional in-person graduation. You know, my graduation plans got leaked, Trey. I don't know if you saw it, but someone beat me, they beat me to it. Someone put it out on social media like two or three days ago, and we've been working really? hard to get it back in. Yeah, uh, but uh, so I don't Thank know. You, I don't know how much of a surprise it is. It really is because uh, several of the students were on the task force and um, uh, some other folks were on the task force. So they already knew, but uh, it got leaked to the media. I saw it on Twitter yesterday. Um, I was like, what is going on? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But it's all good. It's all good. because it, it benefits kids. It's benefiting our kids. So I'm just excited that we, we're going to have to do it. But we're going to have to ask everybody that they're going to have to adhere to the guidelines. It yeah. Is, I mean, it is absolutely essential, and it will not. It will not be any wavering from the expectations of what we expect when it comes to putting this graduation on. We, we will not waver a bend on those expectations at all. Right, two people per uh, two people per, per, per graduate, um, and that that's going to be tough for some parents and some families. I know. I've been making tough decisions since. <laughs> For a long time, and 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 so I'm gonna have to ask the parents to share in this tough decision uh, with us, and and uh, and I know they will. I know I know they will. Um, right, and they have gonna, to wear masks, temperature checks. There'll be social distancing. Yeah, we're gonna ask them to ride in the same, the family to ride in the same cars to reduce the number of cars we have coming in. We don't need students riding with each other. We need students riding with their parents or with their two guests, whomever gotcha. they may be. Um, uh, so. But I'm I'm confident uh, that um, the, this Richland Two community and family hasn't let us let me down yet, um, and uh, so I'm confident they'll 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 do this in a premier way as expected. 
Right. Fallon Brooks wants to know, will the district office reopen? Um, well, we're, we're here by appointment and schedule. If, if you need anything, I, I've been here every day. Uh, I haven't missed a day yet. Um, uh, but I have a very limited staff that's here. But by email or appointment, if you physically need to see someone to get something done or drop something off, that office will be able to meet you here and take whatever you need or help you with whatever you need, um, Ms. Brooks. Can you give her the phone number and email address, Baron? It really depends on who she needs to see. So okay. I would tell her to go right. to the Richmond 2 website and go to the tabs department and, and you can identify the person that you need there. All right. Or you can send an email to our aunt's buzzman, um, who's Kelly Johnson. She can also get it to the right person. All right. Want to quickly uh, wrap up because I know you've got another uh, meeting. Uh, Kevin Raspberry says that he believes as an employee of District 2, there has been an outstanding effort to continue educating our students. Thank you so much for uh, watching and for your comment, Kevin. Also, Marvell Mendenhall says, Dr. Davis, you're doing an outstanding job. Thank you for providing a graduation for the seniors. She says she works in Lexington School District 2 and she hopes that they'll do the same. I know Marvell Lexington District 5 is going to do something similar to what uh, Dr. Davis has said. So hope, maybe the other superintendents will do a, a, a TikTok too. <laughs> <laughs> you should do a challenge. You should yeah, do a so, challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, at least check out my TikTok. I went through efforts to get it done. So I hope the viewers go ahead and check, and check out our TikTok. I think we're going to post it on our different um social media forum. So they'll be able to check it out. <laughs> oh, that'll be great. Fallon Brooks says, uh, perfect. Thank you that she'll yeah. contact them. No All way. right. So <laughs> Baron Davis, Dr. Baron Davis with uh, Superintendent of Richmond School District 2. If people want to contact you, Dr. Davis, how can they do that? I'm at B.A. Davis at Richland2.org. B.A. Davis, Davis, at Davis at Richland2.org. All right, so uh, contact Dr. Davis if you want more information about what's going on at Richland School District 2. As he said, their graduations will be held. Each school will be held a different day. And uh, students should be getting that information when? Oh, uh, today. It's going to start. I think the first graduation is January the um, June 1st, and we'll have one the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. All right. Okay. And so that All information right. should be posted uh, by the time we wrap this call up. I'm almost certain it's going to be posted and, and distributed which school will be on what day and what time. And they're all at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Yeah. And uh, and again, uh, two guests per student. The student has to ride with their guests. Everyone's going to have a specific uh, entry point. You've got to wear a mask. Social distancing will be in effect. And these are strict guidelines so that the kids can have a, a semi-traditional, uh, you know, as traditional as you can celebration. You want to celebrate the seniors. But we've, uh, we've even ordered the uh, the mask. Uh, uh, with their school logo on it for their so have as a, mo a momentum. And a oh, Baron, that video. is so nice. They share with their sons and daughters, ask them why they had this mask for graduation. They can tell the story of COVID-19. Back in the day, right, exactly, <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> That's good, that's yeah. nice, that's a nice momentum. Yeah. A, I mean, listen, you gotta have one, so. And is this for, for the students? This for is for students and, and staff. Um, we'll be given one as well. Um, it's definitely something, a historical event. It is. Um, for, for us. Um, so absolutely. Well, Baron, we know that you've got to run Baron B. Davis at Richland. B.A. B. A. Davis at Richland2.org. B.A. Davis at Richland2.org. If you have any more questions or comments or need some more information, Maxie Moses says amazing for Dr. Davis. Baron, if you've got to leave, I know that you've got another call, but uh, before we leave, before I leave, I am going to uh, read our Jesus Calling. We read it every day after our Coping with COVID. It says on today, May 8th, do not long for the absence of problems in your life. That is an unrealistic goal since the world you live in will have trouble. You have an eternity of problem-free living reserved for you in heaven. Rejoice in that inheritance, which no one can take away from you, but do not seek heaven on earth. Begin each day anticipating problems, asking me to equip you for whatever difficulties you will encounter. 
The best equipment is my living presence, my hand that never lets go of your hand. Discuss everything with me. Take a lighthearted view of trouble, seeing it as a challenge that you and I together can handle. Remember that I am on your side, Jesus says, and I have overcome the world. That's Jesus calling for today, May 8th. I'm Trey Taylor. Please uh, post and share this out, this great information from uh, Dr. Baron Davis for Richland School District 2. Go to my page, Trey Taylor. You can follow me and uh, also go to my public, my professional pages, Taylor May Productions and also Trey Taylor. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to talk with some folks from the, uh, the Democratic Party about the election and about your registering to vote. Tomorrow, uh, Monday, Sunday is the deadline, but you still have time to do that. And then on Monday, we're going to talk to some hairdressers. They want to be an essential business. So we're going to see pro and con what they have to say. And then also next week, we'll talk to uh, Dr. Rosalind Artis with Benedict College. She is on the governor's task force to reopen South Carolina. We're going to find out what they've been talking about and her plans for Benedict. All of that and so much more coming up on Coping with COVID. My name is Trey Taylor. Thank you again for for joining us. Please stay safe, be blessed, and be careful. Thank you, Baron. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> yeah.